Well, welcome everybody to the organometallic chemistry part of Chemistry 2C32. You are two-thirds of the way through the academic material in Chemistry 2C32. It just remains for me to round the course off with ten lectures on organometallic chemistry. And it has to be said that these ten lectures fall into two separate camps. We're going to have three lectures on main group organometallic chemistry, and that's comes before the transition metal chemistry because it gives us a chance to have a few definitions, but more logically, it actually flows very nicely, hopefully, from the main group chemistry that you've been doing with Professor Bachmann. So we are going to have three lectures on main group chemistry and three lectures on transition metal organometallic chemistry. Now, some important things that you need to know are summarised on this slide here. I was quite careful to make sure that all the information on this slide marries perfectly with your module information booklets, but if anybody can spot any discrepancies, please let me know. The module information booklet remains the law on chemistry 2C32 and the first place that we need to look. And essentially, as is my custom, and hopefully that of the other lecturers on 2C32, there is an enormous amount of information on chemistry 2C32 on here. And there is, of course, also the sort of lecture support aids, the recordings of the lectures. What are organometallic compounds? So we need a definition if we're going to have a course, don't we? An organometallic compound is a compound that contains a metal carbon bond. That's all you need in order to have an organometallic. And as I said a moment ago, we're very generous with our description of what constitutes a metal. So we will talk about the organometallic chemistry of phosphorus, of arsenic, of boron in here, even though you would hesitate to describe those elements as metals. So at this point, what I'd like us to do is to sort of have a little survey. You've all hopefully completed these post-it notes and then distributed them on. And since you should be in possession of a post-it note that nobody could hold you responsible for, you'll be in no way inhibited about telling me what the content of that post-it note actually is. That's the theory. Let's see if it works in practice. So what we're doing is we're trying to find out what, if anything, you know about organometallic chemistry or what organometallics you've encountered. So who'd like to go first? Who's got something interesting on their piece of paper? Who's got something dull on their piece of paper? Grignard reagents. Grignard reagents. I'm very pleased that you said Grignard reagents. Have you been having lectures with Dr. Stevenson? He wouldn't let you get away with calling them Grignards. Grignards, of course, just lab slang. These th could should be called Grignard reagents. Okay, does anyone know what the chemistry of a Grignard reagent? What's the formula of a Grignard reagent? R M G B R. Well, that's quite specific. I'll put X in here because R is essentially an organic group and X is a halide. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bromide. And we will talk very soon about what the actual structure of Grignard reagents is in solution, how they behave in terms of their chemistry. Okay, Grignard reagents, that's a perennial one for turning up. Any more? How many people had Grignard reagents on their post-it notes? Ooh, nearly half. <laughs> wow. There is more to organometallic chemistry, I have to tell you, than Grignard reagents. Any more? Anything other than Grignard reagents? PPH3. Okay, well, so that would be uh, triphenylphosphine. Okay, let's just write it down here. Triphenylphosphine. So triphenylphosphine is both, if you accept the definition of phosphorus as a metalloid, an organometallic in its own right, but actually triphenylphosphine is much more important in this course as a ligand. Phosphine ligands are very important ligands for metal, transition metal containing compounds that have metal carbon bonds. So they are more important as supporting ligands for other organometallic species or things that fulfill the definition of organometallic for other reasons. And phosphine ligands as a class, so this is triphenylphosphine, but we will be interested in phosphine ligands in general and see just how wonderful phosphine ligands are and how tailorable they are. There isn't just one phosphine ligand like triphenylphosphine, there's an almost infinite variety of phosphine ligands. Okay, any more? None at all. Ferrocene, okay, good. 
So do you know what the structure of ferrocene is? It is, okay, so this cyclopentadienyl iron is ferrocene, and ferrocene too will feature fairly strongly. We'll have a, a whole lecture on cyclopentadienyl complexes of transition metals, of which ferrocene is certainly one of the first and certainly the most famous. Any more? So you can't be held responsible for what's on your piece of paper? No? Cisplatin. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned cisplatin. What is cisplatin? Cisplatin is an anti-cancer drug, but when a chemist says to you, what is it? I mean, I'm, I'm expecting a formula, aren't I, really? What is cisplatin? You encountered, I mean, I taught you what cisplatin was, didn't I? Last year in chemistry 1C3Y. So, in fact, everybody here, in theory, knows what cisplatin is. Well, cis, of course, refers to our orientation of ligands. We have two chloride ligands and two ammonia ligands. Right, so, is that an organometallic molecule? No. Okay. So, cisplatin is not an organometallic molecule because it doesn't have a metal carbon bond. Very important molecule, very interesting molecule. No organometallic chemistry. So, if an organometallic compound is one that contains a metal carbon bond, then essentially we're not really limited into what the carbon containing function could be. So you've done 2C11 and you've had lots of carbon containing compounds. Some of you might not have done, you would have done the chemistry of carbon compounds in year one, but you've encountered a lot of carbon containing compounds. All of those carbon positions, potentially you could substitute for a metal. Took the number of organic molecules, multiplied it by the number of carbons in those molecules, and then multiplied that by the number of metals in the periodic table, then you have the potential for organometallic chemistry. So it is potentially an absolutely vast subject. There could be more organometallic reagents than there are organic reagents. Now, organometallic chemistry, as we'll see, we have a little bit of a potted history, has been with us for a very long time. Certainly since the 19th century, organometallic chemistry has been studied. But it wasn't until essentially the 1950s that there was an explosion of interest in organometallic chemistry. And people started to recognise and actually had the tools necessary to identify that there were indeed metal carbon bonds present in these compounds. So the real modern, if we can call it that, chemistry of organometallics dates back probably to the 1950s. Certainly for transition metals, it dates back to the 1950s. Main group, perhaps a little bit earlier. What is wonderful about organometallic chemistry, and I use that word advisedly because I'm an organometallic chemist, is that in organic chemistry, you have essentially the same kind of bonding types that come up over and over again. You arrange them in different orders, and you have all sorts of elegant synthesis, so one functional group doesn't inter interfere with another. But you're not discovering any new types of bond. You're not discovering anything fundamentally new. You're just putting things in different orders. In organometallic chemistry, there is a rich variety of bonding modes. We're not just talking about two electron covalent bonds all the time. There's a lot of new types of bonding mode. And my own research group has discovered new types of bonding situation. And that is one of the things, there's still new vistas to explore in organometallic chemistry. And when you, an understanding of organometallic chemistry also leads to a much richer understanding of the nature of the chemical bond. And not only that, of course, that's not good enough to get you funding in these uh, economically difficult days. Organometallic chemistry is really useful. It is applied in all sorts of directions in order to prepare uh, materials, in catalysis, in stoichiometric organic synthesis. So organometallic chemistry has not just a fundamental bonding interest, but also many practical applications as well. Now, there is, in very, very small print here, I don't imagine you can probably read it on your handout, a URL, a web address. And it does not matter in the least that you can't read it. If you must read it because you don't trust me, then you can get a uh, magnifying glass out and look at it in some detail and spend quite some time typing in this gobbledygook into your browser. Essentially what it is, is the URL for this thing. And this, of course, we all know what these are now, don't we? This is a QR code, and it's the QR code that will take you straight to the Chemistry 2C32 Blackboard page, if you wish to go there. 
So this you can flash into your mobile phone and it will take you straight to Chemistry 232 and all of the wonderful content we've got on there. So you won't have to revise that at any length, but if you wanted to use it as a shortcut into the online resources, you can do. Right, so I said we're going to have three lectures on, all, on main group organometallic chemistry. I guess this slide is probably best used as a tick list when you're going through this material. So we're going to cover this set of material this week. And then next week, and for the next two weeks or so, we are going to cover lectures four to ten. And I don't really want to waste time by going over that in advance. We'll certainly cover it in good ground when we get there. Now, course texts. It's probably fair to say that it, three or four years ago, when I was giving this lecture, I would have said the core text that we recommend, be it um, Housecroft and Sharp, or some of you I know will have Shriver and Atkins, the coverage of organometallic chemistry in those core texts, in additions to as, or three as they were at the time, was quite weak, to be honest with you. It's improving. It's improving slowly. If you want, uh, it's fairly self-contained, it must be said, the lecture course I'm providing, but it is based very much on Organometallics 1, and this is Organometallics 2. So Organometallics 1 is about sigma-bonded organometallic compounds, and Organometallics 2 is about pi-bonded organometallic compounds. And these two short Oxford chemistry primers by Professor Botman are excellent little self-contained texts. And because they are in the Oxford chemical primer series, they're really quite cheap an accessible price, and they are a good way of accumulating all this information. I'm not saying they are essential buys, but if you're interested in this kind of chemistry, if you like to have your own textbook on this, I pop to the bookshop or the library and have a quick flick through these, because they're quite good. Organometallic chemistry, oh, I feel the need to sell it to you if I'm going to talk to you for about 10 lectures. So it's fundamental to our understanding of catalysis. And so we need to equip ourselves with the knowledge that I'm going to provide, hopefully, in the next 10 lectures in order to go on later in our chemistry careers, particularly in chemistry 3C32, to talk about homogeneous, heterogeneous catalysis. 90%, 90% of industrial processes go through a catalytic step at some stage. Some of them, many of them, will go through several catalytic steps. And a lot of this catalysis involves the formation, perhaps temporarily, but the formation of metal carbon bonds. So if we understand organometallic chemistry, we can design better industrial processes, more efficient, um, more productive. Who at UEA is interested in organometallic chemistry for its own sake, or for catalysis sake? Well, we have the groups of Professor Botman, um, Dr. Redshaw, Dr. Lancaster, Dr. Camage, and Dr. Richards. Now, Dr. Camage and Dr. Richards, I guess, have already spoken to you a little bit about the chemistry they, they do at second level. And I don't propose to sell anybody's in particular, but just to point out that there is a lot of organometallic chemistry going on at UEA. Organometallic materials chemistry. Well, I'm interested in organometallic materials chemistry. This is where the organometallics are either precursors to important materials, like, for example, titanium nitrides. You can have organometallic precursors. Gallium arsenide, many of you will have heard of as being a semiconductor material. But how do you make your gallium arsenide? The answer is that you make organometallic compounds that are volatile, and you decompose those compounds to make neat gallium arsenide. So organometallic materials chemistry, either as precursors or as or materials in their own right. And then finally, we have, of course, organometallic chemistry in organic synthesis. So many of those organic reactions that involve forming carbon-carbon bonds, which is the preoccupation of many organic chemists, Organometallic reagents are invaluable and used very widely, both in stoichiometric processes, meaning you use one equivalent of your organometallic, you make one metal carbon bond, and catalytic processes, where of course you're making lots and lots of carbon-carbon bonds for every one of your organometallic reagents. And finally, for the biochemists in the audience, bioorganometallic chemistry is an increasingly important area of research. Now, it wasn't recognized for many, many years. It's only in the last 10 or 20 years that people have recognized that there are, in fact, lots of organometallic functions in proteins, in biology. And that's quite surprising. A lot of what I'll talk about in the first lecture, first couple of lectures, is just how reactive these organometallic reagents are. 
They are spectacularly chemically reactive. They're therefore very difficult to handle. So the last place you'd expect to find a very reactive molecule is buried inside a human body. Nevertheless, there are some there. In particular, in very hydrophobic pockets inside proteins, there are a number of important organometallic reagents doing a lot of very essential chemistry. And uh, we won't speak very much about that on 2C32, but we will, I will at least introduce it because I think it's really quite important going forward. And the work of people like Professor Pickett with his hydrogenase and nitrogenase enzymes, those are actually organometallic reagents buried in the heart of proteins that are responsible for processes like generating hydrogen, which if you believe some people is essentially the future of energy on our planet. Historical highlights. Well, I'm taking my time, as I'm prone to do, so I won't spend very long doing these. This is, again, historical potted history of organometallic chemistry. And each one of these intervals in history we will cover in more depth when we get to the relevant chemistry. So we can go right the way back to the 18th century and Cade preparing his diarsenic tetramethyl compound, which we'll get onto, but it wasn't very nice to know. Then, of course, we have Zyzer's salt, which is the first transition metal organometallic compound that was isolated. And about the same time, or a little bit later, we have Edwin Franklin working at Imperial College on zinc reagents, which will feature this afternoon. Zinc reagents are very, very, very reactive, but he managed to isolate these things way back in the middle of the 19th century. We have the reaction that Ludwig Mon found between carbon monoxide, which is a very important ligand, as many of you on the practical course have discovered already. Carbon monoxide is a very important ligand. If you react it with nickel, you can make a volatile nickel compound. And this was the forming reaction of ICI, Imperial Chemical Industries, and drove a lot of the preeminence of British industry. We have Pope's preparation, but Pope's preparation of trimethyl platinum iodide, and we'll look at what the structure of that is. We then have the first examples of carbonyl hydrides. The speed of this process of the rate of discovery tends to increase as we approach the 1950s. So we have Paulson and Miller preparing ferrocene. Of course, Paulson and Miller are the first people to prepare ferrocene, but they didn't get the Nobel Prize for it. That was awarded to those people who recognize what the structure of ferrocene was, not the people who prepared ferrocene in the first instance. So that was a Nobel Prize earned essentially in the 1950s. A second one was the discovery of alkene polymerization catalysis. So those people who discovered how to make polythene, how to make polythene bags, that discovery was made by organometallic chemists working in the 1950s. And after the 1950s, I would have to have essentially a slide like this per year to uh, keep up with the rate of progress. So it accelerated as we converge on the 1950s. Now, do you need to know, you need to have a working definition of what is an organometallic molecule, right? But this point, the lecture material of 2C32, organometallic chemistry is going to start in anger. Hopefully not too angry. Synthesis of organolithium. So what we are going to do is, just like in 1C3Y, and probably to some extent, just as Professor Botman did, we are going to start on the left-hand side of the periodic table with group one. And at the top left-hand side of group one is lithium. And it, lithium organometallic reagents, which I'm going to call organolithiums, are really very important, and we'll see why in a few uh, slides' time. Normally, when I'm doing a list like this, Somebody mentions butyl lithium. Has anybody here encountered butyl lithium? Hmm, okay. Well, many students have often heard of butyl lithium by the time they start 2C32. How would you make butyl lithium? Well, you'd make it the same way as you'd make methyl lithium. And the best method, the most convenient method, and the method that's used industrially is what we call a direct synthesis. So the direct synthesis is if you take an alkyl halide. So this is methyl bromide. Methyl chloride is less convenient simply because it is a gas. So methyl bromide is easier to handle like this. Methyl bromide, two equivalents of lithium. Two equivalents of lithium. This is a two electron process. You do that in diethyl ether, typically at about room temperature is, is high enough. Now, what do you know about lithium from 1C3Y? 
what do you know about lithium? If you're going to do chemistry with lithium metal, what do you have to be get very careful to avoid? You have to be very careful to avoid water. Let me tell you, in, all, in this organometallic chemistry, main group organometallic chemistry, until you get to group 14, you have to be very careful to avoid water. And this afternoon, I will show you why you have to be very careful to avoid water. But that's not just true of lithium. It is true of all of these very polar, very reactive reagents. But lithium metal is special. When you go into the teaching body, you work under protective atmosphere of nitrogen. But you need to avoid nitrogen even if you are going to be doing lithium chemistry. Remember, lithium is special because it actually reacts with nitrogen. So if you're working with lithium metal, you need to use argon as your inert gas. So if we take two equivalents of lithium in diethyl ether under an argon atmosphere and methyl bromide or butyl bromide, then we get one equivalent of methyl lithium and one equivalent of lithium bromide. So that is our direct synthetic method. And this is quite general, this statement of direct methods. A general method of making organometallic reagents, and if you think about it, the one that you are all familiar with, the Grignard reagent, is made through the same method. In the case of the Grignard reagent, of course, Grignard uh, magnesium is in group two, so it goes to magnesium two. That's a two electron process. So the stoichiometry is different, but it's still a direct process whereby you take the metal and an alkyl halide. So that's our direct synthesis of, of organolithiums. There's also methylation, and I'm going to come back to this particular methylation reaction in a few, uh, in a couple of slides time. Essentially, butyl lithium, if we made butyl lithium this way, butyl lithium is a base, and butyl lithium will deprotonate any acid that is more acidic than butane. Let's think about that. Butane you probably don't associate as being a very strong acid. And then clearly, it, it is not a very strong acid. Any compound that is more acidic than butane will be deprotonated by butyl lithium, because here the conjugate base is our butyl anion. So if we react this molecule here, this is C5H6. Anybody who's done perhaps topic three like to hazard a guess as to which C5H6 we refer? It is. So this is cyclopentadiene. I'll come back to it in a moment. Cyclopentadiene plus butyl lithium goes to cyclopentadienyl lithium and butane, the conjugate acid of the butyl anion. So that's two methods. We can use it as a base and do what we've called here methylation. We can have a direct synthesis. We can also do a metal halogen exchange reaction. So here we're reacting lithium metal directly with an alkyl halide. If in this case what we're doing is we're taking butyl lithium, so we already have an organolithium, we're reacting that with phenyl X, so this could be iodobenzene. We act that with iodobenzene and we make phenyl lithium and butyl bromide. So this is an exchange reaction where the halide is being exchanged for a lithium atom. So those are three methods, and these methods don't just apply to lithium. So this is the first time you're encountering these methods, but it won't be the last time on this course you encounter these methods. Now, what do you know about the structure of organolithiums? I think it's probably fair to say that on chemistry 2C32, perhaps even before, you will have encountered organolithium reagents, and essentially, they would have been written down as R L I. And probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but probably nobody would have spent any longer talking to you about the structure of these species except to say they are R L I, they are very strong bases, they are very strong carb anions, they react as nucleophiles. But you might also have mentioned to you that these very polar molecules. So how is this molecule polarised? How would you expect this molecule to be polarised? Yeah. So the carbon at the middle of this R group is going to be negatively charged and the lithium is positively charged. And of course you can do that very easily because you know that lithium is less electronegative than carbon. So that is how that bond is going to be polarised. And this kind of a description 
really explains a lot of the chemistry of alkyl lithiums. So clearly, in terms of looking at an isolated bond, this description is correct. It's fine. However, if this is such a polar molecule, it's a very, very polar molecule. Why does it dissolve in hexane? Why is it when you buy a solution of butyl lithium, you buy it as a 1.6 molar, which is quite a high concentration, or even 2.5 molar solution in hexanes? If this molecule is so polar, it has no right to dissolve in organic solvents. It shouldn't be soluble in organic solvents. So clearly, there is a little bit more to the structure of an alkyl lithium than perhaps you've been led to uh, believe to date. If you look at the solid state structure of these species, or even using certain methods, you can look at the species that are present in solution. What you find is that they are not simple RLI molecules. They form aggregates. And the, there are actually a whole variety of these aggregates formed. The most important are the ones that look like this. So they have a cube-like structure. So what you've got here is um, sometimes described here, so these dotted red lines are describing a tetrahedron of lithium atoms. Now I have to be careful because there's no very strong bonding interaction between these lithium atoms. But if we follow the red lines, that defines a tetrahedron of lithium atoms. So here we are, here's a, a ball and stick diagram. So we have a tetrahedron of lithium atoms in sort of purple color here. And on the face of every one of the faces, sorry, on every one of the faces of that tetrahedron, there is a methyl group. So this is a methyl group. So this looks a rather odd. We don't have a single bond to a methyl group to a lithium center, as we'd expect to draw it here. The actual bonding pattern in an alkyl lithium is what we would call an electron deficient bonding mode. Now, fortunately for me, you've already encountered electron deficient bonding modes with Professor Botman in the context of boranes. So in the context of boranes, you had bridging hydride ligands. And those bridging hydride ligands were interacting with two orbitals from two different boron atoms to form a two electron, three center bond. Hopefully, that rings a bell. We will encounter other examples of two electron three center bonds a little later uh, this afternoon, to be precise. But in alkyl lithiums, this is not a two electron three center bond. This is a two electron one, two, three, four center bond. So the bonding in organolithium is two electrons, four centers. And the structure is essentially, if we draw out all of those atoms, we have a cube-like structure. And this cube-like structure actually explains why it is that these beasties are soluble in organic solvents. Because if we look at this, this species here, what we've got, and now he's going to be very careful, what we've got is a LIR species. So we've established that this is polarized delta plus, delta minus. How is this one adjacent to it polarized? This is going to be delta minus, delta plus. This one is delta minus, delta plus, delta plus, delta minus. So can you see that all of these individual dipoles have another dipole in the opposite direction lined up next to them and cancelling them out? So the overall dipole for this whole molecule is zero. So if you had an individual RLI species, that's an extremely polar bond. No doubt about it, that's an extremely polar bond. If these species aggregate in that fashion, then you do not have a molecule that has an overall dipole, and therefore it becomes very soluble in organic solvents. So what kind of bonding do we have? Well, I've described it a little bit. What you can do, if you like to think about hybridization of orbitals, is you consider that all of the orbitals on your lithium and your carbon three sp3 hybrids. So if we consider the methyl group, then that's fairly easy for us to consider. It is an sp3 hybridized methyl group. And so we, if we go back to here, we've got three sp3 orbitals carrying hydrogens pointing away from our tetrahedron and one pointing into the middle of our tetrahedron. If we go back to this, 
what we have on each face of our tetrahedron are three sp3 orbitals from three lithium atoms pointing towards the middle of the face of that tetrahedron. And therefore, they then overlap with the fourth orbital, which comes from the carbon. And so we only have two electrons, but those two electrons are distributed over four different sites. Hence, two electron, four centre bonding. Now, it's even more complicated than that, I'm afraid, because the solution phase species are these cubic structures that we've looked at before. If you go to the solid state of organolithiums, in the solid state, those species collect together even more, and what you end up with is a very complicated solid state structure indeed. So the important structure, if someone says to you, what is the structure of organolithium? then what I would expect is for you to draw something akin to the cubic structure that you saw in the slide a moment ago. So that's the short and simple answer at a second year inorganic level to what is the structure of an organometallic, uh, uh, organolithium reagent. Now, these species are electron deficient. That's why they form these four centre two electron bonds. And just like in borane chemistry, in borane chemistry you have BH3. What's the electron count around boron in BH3? Perhaps the bottom must have told you this about a week ago, or maybe more. Six. Yeah, okay. There are six electrons around boron. What's the magic number in main group chemistry we're trying to achieve? It's eight. So we are trying to achieve an electron count of eight, but in BH3 we've only got six. Now when BH3 dimerizes to form diborane, does that increase the electron count? No, it doesn't. What it does is it involves all of the valence orbitals, as I like to call them, in bonding, but it doesn't actually bring any more electrons. So, which is why if you do present BH3 or B2H6 with a Lewis base, it forms a Lewis acid Lewis base compound and, or adduct, and that gets you to an electron count of eight around the boron. Organolithiums are no different. What's the electron count? in an organolithium. So how many valence electrons do we have around lithium in an organolithium? Two, okay? Two is somewhat shy of eight, I think you'll agree. So what you have in an organolithium is an extremely electron deficient species. So it won't surprise you at all that these extremely electron deficient species form Lewis acid, Lewis base adducts. And what often happens in chemistry is that actually because you have these RLI aggregates that have no net dipole, one of the important things in directing reactivity is the presence of a dipole. And if you have a species like butyl lithium, which is forming an aggregate, that can actually limit its reactivity. And so what organic chemists often do when they want to increase the reactivity of their butyl lithium is they add TMEDA to it. Ever encountered that? TMEDA is tetramethyl ethylene diamine, i.e. this ligand here. So this is tetramethyl ethylene diamine and it is added to organolithium reagents to break them up, to break them up it actually means that you have a system that is somewhat less electron deficient, because, but because it is no longer such a large aggregate, it actually becomes more reactive. So you're decreasing the electron deficiency, but breaking up the aggregate and producing something that is more reactive. So TMEDA is often added by organic chemists, by organic chemists to systems to increase the reactivity of their organolithium. Now, we have an interesting looking structure here. This is phenyl lithium, phenyl lithium interacting with TMEDA. So if I was to ask you what the electron count for this lithium centre is, how would you reply? Okay, so if it were just phenyl lithium, we've established it, it would be two. We've also established that the magic number for main group com compounds is eight. We want an octet of electrons. But how many has this one actually got? Six, very good. 
Okay, so this is a six electron species because what we have here is lithium. Lithium is in group one, so it has one valence electron to begin with. We form an alkyl bond, a bond, sigma bond to an alkyl group. That's going to be a one electron donor to the species. But of course, it's sharing it, only it's sharing two. So it's got two times a half, so it has an electron here. And then we've got a lone pair on the nitrogen here and a lone pair on this nitrogen. So it is a six electron species. Not an eight electron species, not a two electron species, but a six electron species. And being able to count the number of electrons that our organometallic reagents have is not so important in the main group part, but will become one of the overriding themes of transition metal organometallic chemistry when we get to that. Okay, what are these things good for? What do they do? Well, lithium reagents are pyrophoric. What does pyrophoric mean? Set, someone said it set fire easily. Actually, it's not quite that. Petrol sets fire easily. But if you, uh, when you're filling your car with um, petrol, it doesn't spontaneously burst into flames. So what does pyrophoric mean? It means it spontaneously bursts into flames. And there are different degrees of pyrophoric. Some reagents, if you leave them to stew in their own juices for a little while, they might eventually burst into flames. Other reagents that I like to think as really pyrophoric, if you have the smallest quantity and you expose it to air, it bursts into flames spontaneously. And there's no stopping it. And there's practically no or extinguishing it, frankly. So pyrophoric reagents are very, very dangerous. If you had neat alkyl lithiums, they would no doubt be pyrophoric. But what we normally do is buy alkyl lithiums as solutions at concentrations low enough that they do not spontaneously burst into flames. But if you have them neat, they're pyrophoric. This afternoon, if you can bear to come along at 4 o'clock, I will show you a video of something that is genuinely pyrophoric and um, might change your perceptions about organometallic chemistry, possibly. Now, why are these compounds so reactive? Well, one of the themes I want to develop on in here is that there are two things that we can use to predict reactivity of organometallic reagents. One of them is the electron count. Is this thing electron deficient? Well, we've established that alkyl lithiums are electron deficient. The second point is, does it have polar bonds? Okay, so if something is electron deficient and it po has polar bonds, the chances are it's going to be very reactive. Alkyl lithiums have both. They're electron deficient and they have very polar bonds. So if you see a reaction like alkyl lithium um, and water, you can immediately predict how an alkyl lithium reagent is going to react with water. And a year or so ago, I would have posed you questions like, how does lithium hydride react with water? And I would have expected you to recognize that the OH bond is polarized, delta minus on oxygen, delta plus on hydrogen. The water molecule is still polarized in that fashion. And I would have expected you to recognize that lithium hydride is essentially an ionic solid, Li plus, H minus. So the H minus reacts with the H plus part in that case. That was first year chemistry. Still relevant today, but that was first year chemistry. So we should immediately recognize that this polarity pattern that we've described here, R minus, the R minus bit is going to go for the positively polarized proton in water. And R minus plus H plus is going to give you alkane. So organolithium reagents react very, very vigorously, dangerously vigorously, with traces of water to give you lithium hydroxide and an alkane. And of course, if you've got a lot of heat present, that heat is going to set light to your alkane and you're going to have uh, essentially a flame. So these are very vigorous reagents indeed. And that's not surprising because we've all predicted that the bond is polarized delta minus delta plus. Now, since the bond is polarized delta minus delta plus, there is a large extent to which we can consider the chemistry of organolithiums as the chemistry of R minus species. And since you're all such highly trained organic chemists, you would recognize that R minus is going to be obviously a strong base because it's the conjugate base of a very weak acid. If it's a conjugate base of a very weak acid, it must be a very, very strong base. So these are very strong bases, but you have a negatively charged 
you have a negatively charged centred on a carbon species. So you have a carb anion. That's a pair of electrons and a negative charge on carbon. It's also going to react very effectively as a nucleophile. So organolithium reagents will react with anything that is essentially an electrophile. And that's really very useful, even, it's very useful in organometallic chemistry, it's very useful in organic synthesis, it's very useful in transition metal organometallic chemistry, because many metal halides, be they transition metal halides, or any element to the right of lithium in the periodic table, which essentially is quite a lot of elements to the right of lithium in the periodic table, will react with organolithium reagents as electrophiles to give us new organometallic reagents. So you can't use, well, in limit, as a general sense, you can't use organolithium reagents to make new organolithium reagents. There are exceptions to that. But what you can do is use organolithium reagents to make new organometallic reagents of practically other, every other element to the right of lithium in the periodic table. And we will see lots and lots of examples of that. So they are used in what we would call metathesis reactions. Now metathesis here simply means an exchange of the metal and the halide in these species. So as a very general sense, an organolithium reagent and a metal halide goes to a new organometallic reagent and lithium halide. And this works for any element to the right of lithium in the periodic table.